I would write a story in my mind of my me making it. So me, like, almost like a reporter, Lewis Hatchie, overcome this, beaten X, Y, Z to make it as a professional cricketer with the condition all against all odds, right? And I'd write that story in my yeah. mind. And I'd visualize being handed my cap and signing a contract. And that was my goal. Like I was, again, 15, 16, 17. And then fast forward to when I'm 25, 26 and haven't retired, The Guardian done an article on my story and exactly how I wanted it, exactly how I wrote it. And wow. and I'd got the cap, I got the contract, I signed it. So it's so great I'm having a dream of, I want to be a professional athlete or I want to be a business owner or an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and own a massive business. Okay, but can you visualize the cold nights? Can you visualize the, the lonely hours in an office? Can you visualize the sacrifices you've got to make? So I got injured on july 7th 2016 because i know that's the last time i wore the sussex shirt and cap i went home woke up the next morning and john physio was calling me i could tell in his voice he goes lou you've you've got a bad fracture in your back you know what to do you're going to be shut down for six months to a year the office but i remember that phone call he said look come in and we'll have a chat um, when he told me that what the results were and i went in and i just walked through the door and i I, I couldn't even talk to him. I just bought, bought my eyes. Like I said, a very stoic guy. Yeah. And he said, Oh, Lewis, I'm so sorry. It's like the first time I'd ever heard him say that. And I, oh, man, it just hit me, like really hit me. And that was it. That was that was the end. And the second mountain is where we find our real purpose and fulfillment in life. And I genuinely believe now I'm currently climbing my second mountain. And that's We are live. Here we go. So, guess six of 24. Number six, love Number it. Number six, mate. The legend <clears throat> is Lewis Hatchett. Mate, great to have you on. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, listen, we're going uh, we're gonna to jump straight in. Yeah, so, let's do it. Become a professional quicker against all the odds. Tell the listeners a little bit about Poland syndrome and your journey. Yeah, so my... Uh, mate, first off, thanks for having me on. Mate, just awesome. Before that, like, mate. just great setup here as well like our podcasting as well like i know oh, yeah, yeah. The, the the kit that comes into it and it's pretty cool in here Listen, mate, this, is, this um, is my happy place like, yeah i love mate. it and they've set it up for because you're you're a lot more technical minded than me mate let's be honest i'm a bit of a technophobe when it comes to these things so they set this up so i can press a button and it works so yeah well there's a part of me that's jealous because i have to set it up yeah, i have to set it up <laughs> myself but i wish i had someone for it and you've got all the, <laughs> the, the hands behind the scenes like it's, it's ideal in that sense because we, we will be doing this here if yeah. it was down to me doing pressing buttons but yeah we're good. We're but you're good. good spirits as well like five hours in like it's not Mate, not bad because the 24 hour marathon got, that is I've got, some, um, I've got you on the upslope I've got some great great people coming on to chat about what's not to love and to energize you yeah yeah and exactly that so mate, i'm great again it's for coming in the studio as well and mate, it's, awesome. it's no. just awesome to have you here. no i love it yeah let's get into it i mean so my i i'll go through a real short story of it i'll go through the yeah. as short as i can possibly give usually it's something like a 40 to an hour talk <laughs> but let's try and condense it so I, I played professional cricket for six years at sussex like our local town yeah, our, our, cool. my home sussex is where i'm from even though i've got this australian accent everyone's like, <laughs> kids are like where's he from in australia <laughs> like, no i am from the south coast of of, uh, of of england but yeah six years and i unfortunately had to retire in 2016 through injury but I'd have bitten your arm off if I'd, I'd been told that I could have six years as a professional athlete, mm -hmm. given the fact that when I was born, I was told that I wouldn't play any sport at all. Uh, Mum and dad, as soon as I was born, the doctor diagnosed me with Poland syndrome, which is really fortunate, actually, because mm -hmm. I didn't meet another doctor until I was about 22 that knew what my condition was. It just happened to be that that doctor that delivered me knew what my condition was and just went, oh, it's Poland syndrome. Now, Poland syndrome, for the listeners that don't know what it is, yeah. is a pretty rare condition. One in 100,000 people have it. There's no known cause as to why you get it. So, And it's twice more common in men than it is in women. Uh, but it is not a genetic thing. It is uh, from as much as the reading I've done on it, and I don't do too much, but as far as I've gone with it, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's in the third trimester or maybe the second trimester where like, an artery gets blocked and it, and it reduces blood flow to a part of the body that allows um, that doesn't allow this part of the body to form. For me, it means that I'm missing my 
right pectoral muscle, right. which is pretty much usually how it manifests, yeah. uh, and two ribs that are directly behind it. So the only thing that's protecting my upper right portion of lung is just skin. Now, right. fast forward to professional cricket, yeah, yeah, the wow. balls are freaking hard, right? Yeah. Like they move 90 miles an hour. You've only got a split second. I've broken hands trying to catch the damn things. And like, if you get hit, you not only get bruised, but you, you can break bones. Yeah. If I was to get hit by a cricket ball, and unfortunately I'm left-handed, so my right side faces the bats, the bowler, it, it could wow. kill me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that, the, the doctor initially didn't know I was going to play be a cricketer, but my dad like rushing to him was like, "Can can this young lad, can my firstborn son, uh, play any sport?" And he was like, "No, he won't be able to play that, and and actually won't be able to play cricket because he won't be able to turn his arm over. Rugby's out of the question." And I've never played rugby. Yeah. I've worked with rugby players now, but I don't play rugby, yeah. or I've ever played it. Mad men. And uh, <laughs> I agree, but, I agree. But I then suddenly started getting into cricket when I was. A, young lad in the garden with uh with my granddad and my brother brad obviously yeah, 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 we yeah, both know course, brad very well <laughs> um he so, says he was a bit of a bear cricket oh <laughs> don't get me started on it don't get me started on it he 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 did a video on my story before and like there's a bit that we cut out of it because it was it was sort of he was getting a bit ridiculous he was better than me if i'm honest honestly he was better than me but he had he had the he had the skills he had just the sort of real ability um, and then I just had the drive at the end of the day yeah. and, and, and at the end of the day, that's what gets you to being a professional athlete. Yeah. But we were introduced to cricket just in the garden with granddad, yeah. tennis ball, bat, um, mum and dad just sort of like looked at each other yeah. and like, let's crack on with it, see how far they can get. And we just loved it, wanted to yeah. get into it, went to a local club because our school didn't have it, went to a state school. Cricket has naturally got, um, a private school. It's yeah, usually yeah, it attributed talks. to private schools, yeah, yeah, yeah. but. I was at a state school, didn't have it. So we went to a local club, fell in love with it. I just wanted to be an opening bowler, mate. That's all I wanted yeah. to do. Just wanted to be a fast opening bowler. That was, that was the thing I was hooked on. There was something about the responsibility. What age, what, what age so we started at about, we got to that club at about eight, nine. Wow. I was about yeah. nine. Yeah. And then, and then it's, I can definitely remember being around about 14 and then me just out sitting at dinner table, like slamming my fist on the table, being like, that's it. I want to be a professional cricketer. Yeah. I'm, I'm in. Wow. I'm, I'm in, this is, this is what I want to do. Mum and dad going up, right, well, what do you want to do? And it, and that journey was kind of chaotic because you would go to a trial. So you kind of weasel your way into a trial yeah. and the trials are about a hundred kids to get in only 15 spots. Yeah. And I turned up and there's kids that have got like the best kit that are unbelievable. They're bigger, stronger, faster than me. There's no way I'm better than these. I'm, I'm in the bottom 15 yeah. rather than the top 15 for sure. And I knew that I wouldn't get in based on cricket merit. So I decided over the next six weeks of trialing that we were going to have that every moment I got in front of a coach, I'd ask him a question, I'd nag him. I would just be like, how are they doing this? How can I improve? And the have ultimate you, have goal. You always, have you always been like quite curious like, as, a, is, as an individual like, in life in general? Have you always been like that? So asking questions? Great question. I think actually from at that moment, it was, it was, I want to be at the level of these guys. I know I'm very aware of what I've got and my parents were quite, open and honest about it they mum was always sometimes a bit protective but then dad was like get into it quite stoic in how he would think um and i think i was curious because i wanted to know the answer that what would make me as good as everyone else yeah, like sure. that top lot so i think that's where it was was from and and i would then go home and find videos on the internet of like some of the best athletes in the world i was absolutely addicted to adverts of of like those motivational adverts that yeah. adidas or nike would be throwing yeah. out and th those things i was just addicted to and so that just then fueled the fire it fueled my ability to like be curious ask questions show a good attitude ultimately i thought if i can show a good attitude that i want to develop that might count for something get to the day when they're announcing the team clipboard just brutal in front of everyone like get up stand up come grab your you cap everyone else go home sort of thing and, and it's now probably a text and email that you just sent to sorry you didn't make it or yes you're yeah. in but um I, I i was the last name called i was number 15 <laughs> called and got in and brad got into the junior age group and yeah. we would we played cricket in the garden literally sunrise to sunset we in my imaginations we were turning the garden into like the, the hove cricket ground <laughs> the mcg like lords sorry. and things like that but that's what stoked the fire to get in. I got in to that squad. And, and then from there, it was about, right, now I'm in a f squad of 15. 
games come up and only 11 play, I need to stand out again. And I wasn't getting picked every week. The team sheets would come and I was on the bench carrying drinks, not having an opportunity. And it was, it, it was, but dad then decided, he was like, you got to do something to stand out again. And he decided to give me the phone one day and the phone number, which was the head coach of Sussex, wow. straight to the top, go to the, the senior men's coach yeah. and just ask if you can go train with them, like see if it'll work. And I was like, mate, I'm 14, 15 years old. Like, this is, are you mad? Like, so I'd ring him up nervous as hell. Hello, can I come and train with you guys tomorrow? No, no way. Yeah. They just refuse and, and say no. And I'd ring up the next day, the next day, come back the next week, ring up until one day they just went, actually, we've got a couple of guys that are, that are injured, sick. Can you be in tomorrow? And then I'm stuck wow. in a changing room full of like my heroes. And I was no good. I had no right being in that room. No right being in that room. Where does that, like, that, that, that drive and that determination, like, because not many, I can't imagine too many 14 year olds at that age having that, that persistence to be able to go, I'm, I am going to keep ringing. I'm going to keep ringing every day well, until, I'll get, until I knock down that door. People think when they ask me that, I, I get asked it more now and people think like, oh, he's just born with that, that tenacity to do that. Yeah. I wasn't. Dad helped. Dad would tell me to do it and I'd just kind of turn for mum, be like, do I really have to do this? And mum's yeah. like, I think it's for your bet betterment. So I, I remember, I literally remember being in my parents' room because that was where we had the home phone. Yeah. And it was, um, it's like, if you took it out of that room, you couldn't get signal. <laughs> so I'd be stuck in there and I'd shut the door and be like, right. And I'd be like, pay it was like a film. I was like pacing up and down, like a comedy sketch, like rehearsing my lines, like say this, dial the number, delete it. Oh, well, well, like, yeah. I, it was terrifying. It would take me about three hours to do that call. It's not like I just picked it up and be like, this is easy. No way. Like I was genuinely terrified every moment. Not one and not one moment but got you still, easier. You still do, and like, one thing I take from that like massively, and like, so, so many listeners, I guess, will will resonate with it, but like in life so much, like that comfort zone that we easily sit in a lot of the time. Yeah. Most people most of their lives sit in that comfort zone. And it's jumping out of that is so difficult. So your comfort zone is there. I don't want to make that call, but you're going, yeah. you're stepping out of it every day to try and. Yeah. But, and I think even if you're talking about jumping out of your comfort zone, you got to know what it is that you, you want to jump. Yeah, yeah, what, what is the thing that you're going to do yeah. to, to do it? And it was, a, it was quite strategic, Sam. Like it was quite, mm. um, it was quite thought out. So yeah, yeah. I would actually have a notepad in front of me and like what I want to say, I'd have a script. Yeah. Like I'd write a script, like, Hi, Mark. Good to see you. How are you? Like, it's Lewis Hatchett here. Da, 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 da. Point one, two, three that I want to try and get across. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, one question. Yeah. Can I come can and train I, with you? Can you I guys, can I come and, can, can I play with you? <laughs> like, can, I, can I come and do that? Can I have my ball back? Like, it's kind of that thing, that, kind of like that. But yeah, I, it wasn't a fact of like, I just, oh, let's try something and jump out of my comfort zone. I already was kind of out of my comfort zone with the fact that I was training with kids that were fully able bodied. I loved underdog stories. And I think it, in, the, in essence, there may be people listening to this going, well, I don't have a condition and I don't have, I'm not an underdog. There will be something that you'll be able to find in your life where you've been an underdog or you've not, you've had the odds against you and you'll be able to draw on that and use it. It's just figuring out what it is, looking at it and going, I've had this thing happen to me. And, and ultimately fast forward to like playing with some of the best players in the world, right? Yeah. That. Com and on my podcast where I've interviewed some of the best in the world, yeah. the common theme that's come up is that something bad has happened to them early on yeah. and they have gone through a tough period and they've, they've lent on it a little bit. They recognize that that's their unique thing. Yeah, that's their yeah, yeah. thing that makes them unique. It's kind of, they're a little bit weird, and we're, but we're all weird, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, we've yeah, all got to just, we've just got to accept which part of us is weird. Yeah. And then we've got to move past that. But some people, they try to drop like, not show that weird part of them or that unique side of them. And they try to hide it behind bravado or yeah. external matters and, and, and anything to hide it. Because, because there's still that, there's still a narrative out there, isn't there? That's some form of vulnerability is a weakness. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Which is, you know, I've just done an episode with Chris Goodman about mental health mm. and you, you know, one of the problems with so much mental health is that people don't feel that they're able to, especially amongst men, uh, you know, but that we can't, we have to wear that mask. You have to, you know, because it's so 
because being being vulnerable is a sign of weakness. And if you've got something that's a bit like you said, whatever that that looks like, whatever that weakness is, you don't want to show that because that's vulnerability. Mm. And that's uh, and, and I mean, even in the moments when I'm like calling up this coach, and then I'm in this training room, uh, I'm in the training facility with or at the cricket ground with them, and I've like all my heroes are there. You you're vulnerable through the fact that you're not at that level. Like you're yeah, just yeah, nowhere sure. near them at that level. And I don't think there's no way in hell I'm sitting there going like I'm being vulnerable. I'm actually the opposite at that moment. I'm trying to hide a little bit. I'm trying to be strong. And and I actually speak to this with whether it's with clients or anyone that I'm a massive advocate for being vulnerable. But also there are moments where you do need to show strength. You yeah. you have to show strength in order to to not fake it till you make it or fake it till you become it. But have that genuine belief that I or I'm willing to fight for this thing that I care so much about. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a, I it's not bravado. The, I think that's the, diff, that's for me, that that's where the line is. And that's where the difference is. It's the fact that you go, actually, it's not, it, it, it's not just bravado. It's not just, it is the fact that I, I want this so much. Mm. I'm willing to fight as much as I can to get to where I want to get to. And that's the belief that, like you said, that, that inside you, you know, that's where I'm, that's how I'm going to get there. And, and you've got to sometimes, you know, you, you put your chest out and go, mm. I'm going to go and get this. And that's what, that's what I want. Yeah. And, and like I mentioned at the start of it, essentially having a plan, yeah, yeah, <laughs> having, yeah, having yeah, how yeah, am I, yeah. what's the first step that I can do to, to be this character that I want to be. It's really, really important. I just did a bit of content on my socials recently about support and a friend of mine who hadn't had support from a friend in the way that she wanted it. Yeah. But I said, you need to tell someone how you need support. Cause I'd had that advice given to me. It was really, really good. Like I hadn't told people how I wanted support. If they people know where to go, yeah. like what's the how to guide, what's the step by step process, yeah. then at least they've got a thing that they can do, they can try that gets them from comfort zone to out of it, yeah. or from place they don't want to be to place they want to be, yeah. Yeah. essentially. Yeah. I love it. Well, talk, talk to me then about like because obviously you see, you're knocking down and you've gone in, you've trained and stuff like that. Yeah. And about around sixteen, you was, did you have an injury? You told yeah. you couldn't then. Yeah, so I, I that moment when I got into the changing room, uh, I had again no right being there, not being a good enough player. But I thought if I'm if I can see what the best are doing, because some of these players are well, they are at that team at the time, Sussex from two thousand and two thousand to two thousand ten. Yeah. They're one of the most successful teams in cricket yeah. history. Yeah. They had trophies pretty much every year. Um, team of a decade, and I'm walking in with literally heroes of mine that I was trying to get autographs off the night before, yeah. and. I thought, do you know what, if if I do well or badly, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to try, but I'm also just going to see what they're doing, how are they talking, how are they training. I'm taking mental notes over and over again so that I know that when I leave and I go home, I'm doing everything I can to get to that place. I'm yeah. running, I'm press ups, I'm doing everything. I'm anything that I need yeah. to do, figuring techniques out. And it was just purely an information overload. And then once they let me in once, I turn up again okay. like yeah, foot's yeah, in the door right? you're not letting me go and i did that for so long until yeah about 16 and i got an injury uh, I, I was bowling in the nets and just felt this sharp pain in my back first time i'd ever ever had to stop playing sport couldn't walk move like agony sitting down it took six months to find that i'd, I'd fractured my back like i'd had a stress fracture it was just hidden in this really weird place yeah. um but i had to go through the nhs if i'd been on an academy or anything that I'd have gone through private care and been able yeah, to find sure. it probably sooner. But unfortunately, I, I wasn't at that level yet. So it took me six months to find it, six months in a back brace, like going through my A-levels, uh, and then another year of rehabilitation to get my back back to where all my body back. Because in that moment, I realized my body had failed me. I didn't want my body to be the reason why no one could pick me. I wanted yeah. it to be, if, if you couldn't pick me, it could be <laughs> cricket reasons, that's fine, but not body. like my physicality is my, yeah, yeah. my thing that I'm kind of protective of. Yeah. So I wanted to make myself the strongest player. So during that time off and when I wasn't playing, I went, I would nag the coaches to use the facilities. I'd sneak into the gym at the, at the cricket ground. I'd get kicked out at like 11 at night on a Saturday night regularly because I was in there trying to go through my program, get my body stronger. And I just saw in this gym, they had the players fitness scores and like what they were all scoring. And this is the pro squad. And I just like looked for the number one player and then like rummaged around for this guy's training program, asked the coach, like, what's his training program? 
whatever he's doing, I'm doing more of it. I'm just going to get to that level or get close to that level as, as, at a young, because I know if I can get close at, at 16, 17, 18 and be impressive, physically impressive, that's at least something I'm impressive at, right? It's one thing that I'm good at. Again, like listening to that, and I, I, I'm really, obviously I've, I've watched your video a few times, and I and I think even Brad mentioned like 16, 17, 18, that point in your life, mm. how many of friends and people are out partying, drinking, and you're in a gym at 11 o'clock yeah. on a Saturday night. Like, well, didn't have social media, so yeah. really real big advantage. I didn't have anything to distract me too much, yeah, um, yeah. but also, yeah, girls were fun, but I weren't really, I wasn't like, unless you're getting in the, going to help me get towards my goals, I'm not really too interested at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I agree. One of the things I tell parents, so if there's anyone listening that's a parent and has a yeah. up and coming child that is a, a child prodigy, maybe at, yeah. at whatever sport it is, and they are below the age of 15, wait like yeah, yeah. wait until 16 hits wait until they can drive wait yeah. until they can drink wait until they can go out right everything yeah, yeah. and that then opens up the world and you then find out a lot about someone when the distractions yeah, yeah. come in yeah, yeah, you find yeah. out how much it means because not only that and it's now a completely new age for young people because they've not only got that coming on to them but then they've got the expectations of others they've got the expectations of what it should be how they should act how they should do things on top of that so you have to in my opinion yes i was mentally strong to do it through that period but you got to be even the lewis who would have to do it now would have to be even stronger yeah. like there's so much more to fight off which is why i'm so keen on with my work to advocate having as many weapons in your armory yeah. having as many tools and people that you can lean on to help you get through that because it's going to be really it's hard tough. to do it on your own really hard to do it on your own right so but, but even without those distractions there's still like that single mindedness that like 60 you just like it's, talking about your journey and listening to it up until this point like there's just still that that single mindedness that i'm this is i am going to become a professional mm. i'm going to become a professional quicker no matter what i'm going to get there yeah I, I i tell a story of when i was in that period of my life when i was like working hard to um build my body up build my fitness and one of the things i did was um i would go out running late night runs and yeah. it was winter time freezing cold be about 10 o'clock or something and my, i was living at home and i'd be putting on a woolly hat put my shoes on mum would catch me by the door and be like where are you off what are you doing no don't go out and be the be that verbal voice that we all have yeah. that's telling us it's too cold don't do it stay in yeah. you don't you shouldn't do it, do it tomorrow whatever and she, but she was that physical voice she's your mum like don't yeah, 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 don't yeah, go yeah, out yeah. don't be silly she to protect you. yeah exactly and i'd be like no this is the thing that i've got to do i'm dedicated i'm keen to do this but whilst i was out running i knew what i would do is i'd run this regular route around the local town and village and i would write a story in my mind of my me making it so me like, almost like a reporter lewis hatchie overcome this beaten xyz to make it as a professional cricketer with the condition all against all odds right and i'd write that story in my mind and i would just go around this jog 5k so half hour what, yeah, and yeah. just do that over and over again i'd get to this last little bit of the the run it's like my rocky moment where it's up a hill and i'd visualize being handed my cap and signing a contract and that was my goal like i was again 15 16 17 and then fast forward to when I'm 25, 26 and haven't retired, the Guardian done an article on my story and exactly how I wanted it, exactly how I wrote it. And, right. and I'd got the cap, I got the contract, I signed it. So I'm a big believer in if you can genuinely see it in your mind, if you can see where it's at, at the end goal, you can figure out the steps to get there. And genuinely know the journey that you're going to go on like what's it great having a dream of i want to be a professional athlete or yeah. i want to be a business owner or an entrepreneur yeah. and own a massive business okay but can you visualize the cold nights can you visualize the the lonely hours in an office can you visualize the sacrifices you've got to make can you even visualize your mates taking a piss out of you for doing something different than not going for a drink with them having a beer and you saying no and doing the thing that means the most to you can you visualize all of that on the journey to this big end shiny goal at the end of it wow that that for me is like 
we're both fans both listen to the high performance podcast yeah i'm a big fan of that and you, you listen to people talk on that and that about visualization and, and talking about high performers and getting to that and like just listening to this story and and which is just fascinating but how inspiring just to anything we achieve in life one's going to be hard work mm. you know anything anyone wants to achieve is going to be hard work it's not just given to us but to have that and like i said for me it's the visualization actually seeing where i'm going to get to and what that end goal is and where and I, what, what i'm really keen to touch on with that as well because i often talk about this like that journey and that destination and etc uh, etc et but for, for, for you was there that moment you signed that contract mm. was that your was that you, your euphoria moment or was it oh did, that's just the start of my journey i i think any athlete that tells you that one of their high one of their favorite highlights is anything else or not anything else but having signed that initial first contract isn't one of their highlights is lying a little bit it's a phenomenal feeling but yeah, sure. like that journey for me that when i when i um came back after my working hard in the gym yeah. i came back and i wasn't the best player by any stretch the coaches actually didn't rate me yeah. so they the season had ended actually i need yeah. another six months until i could play cricket so i went to australia hence this accent yeah, yeah, yeah. and i i went out to adelaide and i fell in love with my team and my mates out there and i've gone back ever since yeah. but in that journey but just before i left i sat down with the coach and said like what do i need to do in order to become a professional give me a list of things i need to do yeah. so he gave me a list bloody long list go away and i just worked night and day on that again ticked everything off come back but back then, this is 2008, so Facebook yeah. was invented the year before. So yeah. there's no like being able to show, hey, look how I'm doing, look yeah, at making yeah. everything look great. Yeah. It was the odd email just to check in and just texting mum and dad, making sure I'm okay, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And when I came home, I knew I was better, but they still went with guys who they'd been working with in England. Rightly so. They'd yeah, been yeah. putting their blood, sweat and tears into those guys. And I just said, look, I want an opportunity. So I sat down with the head coaches and just said, look, give me three games in the reserve squad to be the opening bowler. And if I do well in those games, let me carry on doing it. But if I don't, I'll ride off in the sunset. You won't see me again. And I took 21 wickets in three games in those in those wow. those two uh, those three games. Yeah. And uh, they were like, okay, cool, got to keep them on. <laughs> but then they they put me on the the bench of the first team about a month later i yeah. jumped on the bus i was working in a smoked salmon factory that i've put in petrol in my banged up fiesta so put all that to one side jumped on the bus packed my bags and started traveling around the country with the team it was unbelievable like i'm 20 years old now doing things but i'm carrying drinks but we get to this one game in london and it was uh it was highlighted as one of the biggest games of the year at, because international players were all back yeah. There were 22 players going to be playing in the game, 11 on each side, and 15 of those 22 were from international countries that were yeah, playing yeah. for their country at the time. Yeah, yeah. Whether that was Pakistan, England, West Indies, New Zealand, there was t it was I was just going to be happy to be sitting on the bench because I was like, I've got the best seat in the house. Yeah, I've got yeah, I might yeah. even be running on every now and then <laughs> with a drink, right? <laughs> but half an hour before the game, our big overseas player uh, got injured, done his ankle, and then coach comes and says you got to play here's your cap here's your shirt first person you got a bowl to is the england captain good luck i'm like whoa wow. <laughs> mum and dad flying up on the m25 like what goes through your head at that moment terrified really yeah i've got andrew like, strauss i got a bowl to like this is terrifying but everything you dreamed of man here it is and then yeah wow. well instantly i forgot how to bowl i was like <laughs> <laughs> how do i do this no hold on i remember i remember i remember <laughs> but it's so amazing like going into and we can touch on it a bit like some of the performance psychology stuff i now know some of the stuff that i was going through i didn't really know what it was but i kind of grasped onto something at the time i remember bowling my first spell and every technique that i'd thought of on that day just wasn't working yeah. and i remember thinking to myself just throw it and I didn't throw it, yeah. but I, in my mind, my body, I started throwing it and I reverted to this weird technique that I was doing. And I started essentially throwing it in my mind yeah. and it made me bowl well. And I did all right in that game. And then we got to the, we, we finished this game and it was epic to be a part of. And then we go to the second game down the road and, uh, or the next game. And I, the guy was injured, got back in. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to sit out and my time's done. But they dropped someone else and kept me in, gave me another opportunity. And I took five wickets in the first innings of that game. There's like, wow. so if anyone doesn't know cricket, it's like scoring a hat trick in yeah, football. Absolutely. So yeah. it's, it's, it was a great moment. And I remember coming off, doing a bit of media, getting applause coming off from the crowd, um, a shower changed. And then this was the most vivid moment of my life was the 
car that I was going into, this green car that I was going to be driving back to the hotel for the night, the coach that I'd been ringing up that said, we're going to go with these guys that didn't rate me, that, that said no so many times. He said, Lewis, we're going to offer you a three-year contract. You've done it. And I remember driving back wow. with the, I remember driving home from that game after it had finished. And the, one of the, the two guys I was driving with were the physio at Sussex and the analyst at the time. And these two guys, the physio had been there through all of my injuries. Yeah. He'd helped me. And he was the guy that I nagged to go in the gyms late at night. Yeah. And the analyst had known me since I was a real young kid. He, he'd done a lot of my junior cricket. He'd been there throughout that yeah. time and as his career progressed. And they both just kind of went silent. They're like, Lewis, we are so proud of you. Wow. And it always brings like shivers down <laughs> yeah, my spine because yeah, yeah. they're like, we're so proud of you. Not, not only just because of you getting a contract, but where you've come from, what you've done. And it was the first time I'd ever got verbal recognition for the journey I'd been on. Yeah. And it, it, it nearly knocked me down. Like I was just so emotional yeah. just because it was like that. Oh my God, what have I just done? And, and looking, it was the first time I got a chance to really look back and go, holy hell, that was that, one hell of a journey. Work, though, that 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, the same what, night, it was worth it. That, it was worth it for that, it, for that moment. And then, and then essentially your professional career starts. Yeah, and yeah. it's and it is kind of like, yep, yeah, now it begins because now it turns into a job. Now it's people chasing you. You're not chasing something. People are chasing you. You're always chasing yourself then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're you're trying to get into a team. Politics comes into it. It becomes a completely different environment for sure. Yeah. And, and some of that fairy tale does get brushed off. Yeah, yeah. Um but I, I, I think. But do you still look at that? Like, I'm keen to just, just explore that, that, that moment. Just to, do, do you look back and you talk about it now and really go, I really appreciate that moment. That, that, how special that moment was. Yeah. To all that hard work and all that, because so many people talk about, you know, achieving certain goals in their life, and then afterwards it's a bit of a downhill. I've, mm. I've achieved that, and it's not what it was, or, or whatever that looks like, but just actually really just genuinely appreciating that moment in that time and just going, wow, I've, I've achieved something that I knew I'd always get to. And maybe like you said, how many doubters and people out there that mm. maybe said, you never make it, you're never going to get there. But just that, I can, I can only imagine like that feeling of just ultimate pride in yourself. Like you've got yeah. these other people telling, but just in yourself that you've done that. Yeah. And, and I get little glimpses every now and then, like yeah. this year, um, someone told me, one of my coaches that was in when I was a junior yeah. um, that I was trying to get through the age group squads and stuff like that and trying to fight my way in. Uh, I found out that he had said that I was no good. Like he, he was like, he was rubbish. <laughs> like he was, he, but it's, it's little things like that. You just hear these people that had doubted you along the way and you go, Oh, br kind of brilliant that I didn't hear it. And, and I, I always think I was slightly naive to it. I kind of knew people doubted me. I thought, yeah, but I just didn't want a little bit does motivate you i think it does um to prove 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 people wrong but i think i think i was just super naive to it i liked being blissfully naive to yeah, the fact yeah. that there were there were doubters there yeah mate fair play i want to i want to talk about uh, we've we delved really into a little bit about mindset and obviously mm. now you as a mindset coach i guess you help people to be more confident yep uh, you have you know and who they are manage their stresses of the profession and and a sort of a positive perspective on life yeah i guess yeah 100 so one, one one thing i read and obviously i find really fascinating your your ethos around human first professional second yeah so talk talk to me a little bit about yeah that, I'm, I'm... Ch changed it for this podcast slightly for so, athlete, athlete second yeah, 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 but, yeah, I, I, but I, yeah. I tend to believe like you can be a professional you can be a business athlete you can be a corporate athlete yeah. it's not i think when people hear the word athlete they think it, you've got to have a body of adonis yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. not it's it's uh someone who is trying to be better than they were before yeah, yeah. you're just striving to be better yeah. um and you you enjoy what you do yeah. but yeah my the, all of this work stemmed from me losing my career so i i got a injury in 2016 again it was a, a rear well a worse back injury this time the fracture was going towards my spinal cord and the coaches were like the the doctors were like look it's not a case of if this will happen it's a case of when and there's so many questions around that, whether it was my biomechanics, whether it's my condition. Um, I, I had, if I look back at it and if I'm really honest with myself, yeah. I had always felt pain when I was playing. You feel pain when you play cricket, yeah. but I had never, ever walked onto that pitch with the full confidence that I will probably 
not get injured today. I, I always had it in the back of my mind. And I actually think it was a hindrance to my performances because I didn't get essentially full freedom. It's just intense yeah, playing at that yeah, level. Yeah. It's the training and everything. But when I when I finished and I came out of the sport, I recognized that one of the worst questions I could get asked at the time was, what are you up to, Lou? Yeah. I hated it. Like I'd sweat thinking about it. And, and you saw me, I started ever, working ever, with Brad. I was 26. So Brad had just started Network My Club yeah, cool, yeah. and he was starting the business. He was completely on his own. So I said to him, look, mate, you need a hand. Uh, I'm obviously ex-pro athlete. You're in sport. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to put on a suit and help you out and give you give you support you probably need in this period of your business. And at the same time, I might figure out what I want to do along the way. Yeah. I kind of knew I, I knew I didn't really want to be in that, that world yeah, with yeah, Brad, sure. but I was really keen to help my brother out. I had another eye on uh, yoga and mindfulness, and that's where Sport Yogi came from. But I really recognized that I had left all of my my identity was on cricket. Yeah. When someone asked me, like, what are you up to? Or even at those bit, those networking meetings, what do you do? I would want to ask answer that with, or I would answer it with, I'm a former professional athlete, or I played cricket, or I'm cricket, 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 right? It was just all athlete or cricket. Define, define yourself. Right? Purely defined myself as an athlete. And I, that is really where a lot of athletes fall down. You throw everything onto your identity. So I hadn't spent time figuring out who's Lewis, what's he about? And then I started to look at, well, there's so many more characteristics and attributes that I have. I remember in my reviews at Sussex, I, I would go into them hoping that the coaches would tell me how good a bowler I was, mm. but they would come back to me and say, you're one of the hardest working, driven, um, like persistent athletes, consistent we've, we've ever seen. And that's an, and I used to go, yeah, yeah, all right, but tell me how good I am at bowling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I forget, and I just dismissed it, and I shouldn't have, because now I go drive hard work, enthusiasm, passion, I can put that in anything. I can put that into absolutely anything. That's who I am. So that's me. That's what I'm about, right? So one of, in, in my work that I do, if anyone, be cool to, we can do this with you now and do it with the, the listeners. It's an exercise that I do. It's called human being, human doing. Yeah. And so what all you got to do is you write down a list of two, two lists under human being, you write down all the characteristics, values that you believe you are. Now that could be empathetic, kind, generous, hardworking, committed, list yeah. goes on, right? Yeah, yeah. Under human doing, write down all the roles and responsibilities that you have under life. Now you are not only a business owner, a podcaster, you're probably a son, a friend, a brother, a dad, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. all of these characteristics you are, right? Maybe even your passions, a surfer, a painter, a, yeah. a dancer, a musician. And when you've got those two lists, you put them side by side, and then you link the characteristic, the human being with the human doing. So you might then start to find that you are a consistent, a, a committed golfer, a persistent entrepreneur, a loving partner. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you actually can define your values a lot easier. You can define what you're about far easier. You can actually then figure out what your motivations are a lot easier because you're you're identifying who you are and the different areas of you that there are. There's not just one thing, there's many things, but with those roles, those human doings that you do, you have many different layers to how you, what you bring to them. I, I absolutely, love, you know what, listening to you talk about it, there was, an, there was a podcast I listened to with um, Dr. Rang and Chatterjee, yeah. and he talks very similar about this, and he, he was saying exactly, because he's, he goes, I'll define myself as I was a doctor, mm. and then he goes, and then, but, and I'm also, I'm a, I'm a father. So what happens then when my, when something happens and I'll stop becoming a doctor? What happens when my kids actually get up and leave home? Is that, I'm still going to be a father, but I'm not a father figure there because like, yeah. they're not there anymore. So and exactly, he was talking about it and I found this fascinating, so interesting to hear you talk about it because it's exactly that. Like, actually, once you've got what your core values are as a person, you then relate that to everything that you do in, in, in your life, because like, that's who you are as a person mm. and you're not then defined by it. Because that must have been, I just, I just want to quickly go back to that, that point of, of when, at 26, when you're told that you're not going to play quick, mm. that immediate, something you strive so hard to get and you had six years in, but what, how do you feel at that moment when you're told that you can't play anymore? Mm. What, 
talk to me. I, re- I remember the phone call, the physio. So I got injured on July 7th, 2016, because I know that it's the last time I wore the Sussex shirt and cap. And the, I walked off, I, could, I had to be kind of helped off the field because I, I couldn't, my muscle, my back had seized up. I was completely spasmed through my legs and things like that. And uh, I remember getting on the physio table, doing some of the tests because it calmed down by the time I got on the physio table. And I was like, I'm fine, John, like the physio, I'm not, I'm fine. He goes, man, I think I've got to send you for an MRI tonight. And I, I, I was willing to call up the chairman of Sussex to get him fired <laughs> for like, the, he doesn't know what he's doing. And I was just such, I was being such an asshole that night because, but I was just so emotional. And um, I went home, woke up the next morning, and John physio was calling me. I could tell in his voice, he goes, Lou, you've, you've got a bad fracture in your back. You know what to do. You're going to be shut down for six months to a year. Like this is even if we didn't, we didn't know the extent of it by then went to the doctor and he was like, look, this is where it's going. And it, and it, and it was, uh, and then had to make the decision go into the, the office. But I remember that phone call. He said, look, come in and we'll have a chat. Um, when he told me that what the results were and I went in and I just walked through the door and I, I, I couldn't even talk to him. I just bawled, bawled my eyes out and I walked out the door and I was in the, if anyone knows the county ground, I was literally like on the, I was on the, um, I was, I was on the balcony just crying. And then I, people were coming. I went down, um, pavilion. I was crying down there. And then like my, my dad rung me to, um, will text me to say like what happened. And I texted him and I said, oh, I've got another, it's a, it's another bad fracture dad. And it, and my dad, had, my dad's a very, like I said, a very stoic guy. Yeah. And he said, Oh Lewis, I'm so sorry. It's like the first time I'd ever heard him say that. And I, fuck, it just hit me, yeah. like really hit me. And that was it. That was, that was the end. And it's, it's that really, it's a really tough moment. Like I said, I know the date when I last wore the shirt and the cap, I've still got them all like they're, they're, they're there, but, um, I always like to look at those moments and think like, well, what did I, what did I, I needed to go through that. I was a very um, closed off young man yeah. when there and having that experience has made me a very open one. So yeah. I actually really look at as much as I can in the positive for it. It's very tough to take myself back to it and just think like, geez, what if, what if, what, when, and I, I don't like doing that, but I, I sit with it. And a lot of people say like, you should never, you should never think what if you should never think like what happened and and think badly about your career and i go why not like you should be very aware of the negative emotions that you feel in your life because if you're not if you're trying to block them out yeah. if you're trying to get rid of them you can't learn from anything you can't you can't you'll hide it it will manifest itself yeah. in someone else it could it could become a snappy anger at your partner your friend if you've just not really dealt with that emotion i'm more than happy to say how, how I was crying through that moment. I'm more than happy to say how much it meant because geez, if you want to be a real man and say, well, what are you doing for crying? I go, well, did you go through that journey? Did you go through that? Did anything like that mean enough for you? Cool. Like this is how hard it was. And that's why it meant a lot. But look, thanks for sharing that. I, 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 I guess I'm keen to, to look like, like now where you are now, like you, I, I've known you over the last few years and mm. just out you know, passionate, enthusiastic, all these values you're talking about, mm. how you come across. And even when, like I said, I still, I remember I was at the Network My Club one when you was there with Brad yeah. and I'm, I'm doing some stuff with Brad now and like, but just still with it, with a smile on your face and enthusiasm for what you were doing. Like, and I, I can only imagine deep down how tough, maybe that, obviously that period of your life must have been when you go, you've strived so hard, got to your dreams and then you, you know, it's almost taken away from you. Yeah. To then be, but then, the, where do you, where are you right now? Like with all the stuff you've done around sort of mindfulness and, yeah. and and mindset, are you able to almost let go of that period? Do you, how do you, yeah. do you still feel about it's that? It's tough when the it's tough when I'm kind of involved in the game still. So I play on a Saturday. And it's locally yeah. in Sussex, so I'm very very involved at Sussex at the just yeah. sub below the pro level, because yeah. um, my injury allows me to play once every weekend. But I think, um, I think, yeah, I'm, I am at peace with it in the sense that I know I can't go back to it. I just know I can't. I, I feel like I can, but there's definitely moments that catch up with me and go, no, Lewis, th- th- your body is telling you otherwise and things like that. So that's good. So then I, I spoke to someone recently about a book called The Second Mountain. Yeah. I, I 
forget the author of it. I haven't read it and it's on my to read list. Yeah. But the concept of the book is around how we conquer one mountain mm. and that's the mountain that we strive for from a young age. But yeah. then once we've conquered it, there's a second mountain and the second mountain is where we find our real purpose mm. and fulfillment in life. And I genuinely believe now I'm currently climbing my second mountain. And that's the thing that I'm really fulfilled in doing, which is taking all of these lessons, these learnings, the expertise, the, the diving into performance psychology, uh, building my own businesses and, and doing that side of it, whether it's going well or not, it doesn't really matter. It's the fact that I'm enjoying it. But the, the stuff that I love is this is mindset coaching and being able to to chat with some amazing people mm. that ultimately have very real and normal issues, but are just put on a pedestal purely yeah. through their label that they've got. Yeah. Hence why you essentially look after that human being first. Like you just take care of that person first because that's always going to be there. Yeah. The, the roles and the mountains they're climbing are going to change, yeah. but the person climbing it isn't going to be consistent. And I know you talk about values and behaviors and yeah. things like that. And it's a huge thing to, to talk about in in businesses and i think like many allude to on your podcast like you can have them on a wall and then be slogans right but that exercise that i showed you the human being human doing what it allows you to do is figure out what type of business person you are what type of athlete you are like every entrepreneur is going to be different you might be a curious entrepreneur you might be a dedicated entrepreneur you might be just a resilient entrepreneur right whatever you define yourself in do it because yeah. You'll then be able to make better decisions. You'll be able to make partnerships a lot easier because you're like this. This fits me and and my va my own core values. I I have sought to really like dive into them and unpeel peel them back a little bit. Two things that I'm really keen on that I think I look for in people are enthusiasm and curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're th enthusiastic, yeah. I'm all for you. Yeah, like I'm in. Yeah, yeah, like if you're yeah. curious, I'm in. Yeah. Like and then there's little things for me just around. Um, being able to like do hard things in hard times and stuff like that and but curious and enthusiasm it's amazing I, that, what, what's fascinating just like that your whole story is just so inspiring and and you know how many times i've heard you talk or i've watched your videos and I'm honored that you're here and sharing it with me and, and listening today just it's fascinating there's so many life takeaways that people can get from that but i guess now i get I guess for me, what, what's really fascinating is now looking at you as an individual and going, I, I, how enthusiastic and optimistic and stuff you are, mm. looking at the stuff that you're doing and finding out actually from from my journey and from that story, I can, I can really help and inspire other people when, when you talk about mindset. Because I'm really keen to, one other thing I'll talk about with the as, from a professional athlete point of view is about perfectionism we talked yeah. a little bit about this offline and i know yeah. as, as, as as professional athletes you're striving like it sounded like when you're talking about your visualization you're striving mm -hmm. for that perfectionism but do, do you as a professional effort you like that, are you still like that today do you think like, yeah so perfectionism i've done i've done a bit of stuff in this and, yeah. and i've done pod, i've done my own podcast yeah. on it um mainly because i i'm doing my masters in performance psychology and one of the areas that really flicked my switches was perfectionism mm -hmm. just even so that i did an assignment for that yeah. on myself I, you, we were given an opportunity to do it on someone else i flipped it and said i want to do it on myself and the and the, the question that i was answering was who am i in regards to perfectionism now perfectionism in a nutshell is split into two things is perfectionistic strivings and perfectionistic concerns and if you have high perfectionistic strivings but low perfectionistic concerns that's essentially an elite performer yeah. and and that those perfectionistic strivings are really ripped in that you can open them up right yeah. and and then really at the end at its base level it is i have really high standards yeah. and then then you start to go into well where are those standards come from are they self-orientated perfectionisms but they come from within perhaps they're socially prescribed perfectionisms that come from in or it could be other orientated perfectionisms that are your expectations or hopes for others to be perfect right like yeah, that's yeah. coaches and yeah, leaders yeah. sometimes i yeah, want sure. i want how many leaders would you have met right that would have hired someone and had this feeling of why are they not at the level <laughs> that i hope them to be right now Sure. that's your expectation that's your perfectionism on them 
that's mm-hmm. what it is mm-hmm. and perfectionism really for young people as well is we're held in a society where these socially prescribed perfectionisms are at an all-time high they're friggin everywhere yeah. like the expectations of others is absolutely everywhere what you want to look like sound like what you want to achieve you should social media has got you should have been a millionaire yesterday <laughs> like every, everything right it's just crazy but the tough thing with perfectionism is it has its drawbacks which is these high perfectionistic strivings with that some of the symptoms can be things like procrastination can be concerns over mistakes your doubts over actions you doubt what you're doing might you might class that as imposter syndrome right and i i've talked about imposter syndrome before where i don't think it's a bad thing i think my contrarian view on it is that uh, imposter syndrome be, be grateful for it if you've mm-hmm. got imposter syndrome, be grateful that you've got it because you're probably in a place of authority or a place of, of people want to listen to you. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know what you don't know. Imagine if you didn't have it. Imagine if you didn't have imposter syndrome. You'd be going around not thinking you needed to improve. You wouldn't yeah. be aware of the standard you want to try and achieve. Yeah. Therefore, you're probably not a higher performer. So not, it's, it's a different way of looking at it yeah. uh, because people get so wrapped up in the negative emotions that they feel from it and go, well, I I'm not here. I'm not there. I'm, well, look at where you are. Mm. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you've achieved so far. Uh, right? that's, that's a lot to do with, like you said, about, like I hear you talk about gratitude. And I think that's mm. where I think certainly from when I, I sort of think about that, like that person, you, you get to different points. It's try, actually being grateful for where you are, looking back at that journey and looking at what you have achieved and where you are and, and being grateful for those yeah. moments. For, for me personally, like when I, I struggle with certain bits like that, it's looking at, oh, I've not achieved so much, but then if you actually stop and go, oh, actually, I've done all right, really, or yeah. where you are, and that's and being grateful for that. that yeah, well, gr- gratitude's an interesting one, isn't it? Because people just say, just be grateful, just yeah. be grateful for everything you have. And uh, someone, Amanda Pressgrave, who's a, a triathlete who was on my podcast, yeah. she did something brilliant and we were talking about it and she asks at her and i'm going to do this for my birthday so anyone listening that knows my birthday coming up you might get an early early idea is that instead of people she asked her friends and family instead of sending her like a happy birthday she asked everyone to send her a moment in their life where she had positively impacted them and she was blown away at the responses that she got but every single response she could be grateful for she could be grateful for the person that she had in their lives that would be willing to send that response back mm. but not only that grateful for what she was able to give that person and then everything that had come from it and that was just like a really great way of tangibly being able to come up with gratitude because i think a lot of people struggle to figure it out yeah. themselves yeah, 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 ultimately yeah. you do want to just think like well if this thing wasn't or person wasn't in my life would yeah. my life be easier or harder yeah. if it's harder be grateful for it yeah yeah. That, that's another way of looking at it yeah it's fascinating I, oh, mate, I could i could talk the whole mindset and we could we need another we need another 24 hours just 100%, you, just yeah here, mate, and yeah having, <laughs> having a chat on it but it was um mate it's fascinating listen your, your whole like i said for me the inspiration of your whole story and that it is is un, unreal in all honesty like when you start from and it's great to just sit there and talk about from that young age and that mindset and that drive to actually achieving it and then and even and grateful for you sharing that you know obviously a painful time as well when you you know when you stop mm. playing cricket and then afterwards but still like i say every time i've ever met you your enthusiasm um optimism <laughs> and for everything you do the podcast is great the sport yoga mm. you do is great and the mindset stuff so it's mate a fascinating journey and the amount of stuff people will take from this episode is, is, no, is yeah. amazing so i'm grateful for you coming on mate. You appreciate it no, i appreciate it coming on well, look we're we're going to wrap up with my quick fire questions. All right. As, yeah, as cool. As I sort of chuck out. So one piece of advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Oh, don't try to be like, don't try to be like your heroes. Just be yourself. I spent a lot of time trying to be like some of the people I was trying to emulate yeah. in, in, um, and dismissed my authentic, way of doing it so i think try and figure out your own i I did figure out my own way but i spent a lot of time trying to be like other people and do too too much of what they were doing yeah right who's been your biggest inspiration throughout your life and why oh it's a tough one like my my parents have been huge supporters of me um I, 
I kind of always think of like who I'm going to be like that. I'm always inspired by the person that I'm striving to be, which sounds mm -hmm. selfish, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I really, I am inspired by the person that I possibly can become and all the things that I can do. That's, that's really inspiring. I'm, I'm inspired by people like my brother that, that I see him just grinding away at what he's doing and, and, and him doing well. And yeah, but ultimately I think where you, where those, where I can be is a real big inspiration for me. No, that's actually cool. And not, not one that I've heard before, but mm. I ask these questions a lot on, on the podcast and I love that. Mm. I love that. Could you recommend a book or podcast for our listeners that said an impact on you? Yeah. Um, a podcast that's really big. I know you listen to a diary of a CEO, yeah, but that's... one of his, one of his, um, guests, Mo Gordat. I'm a huge yeah. fan of Mo Gordat. So his, his podcast in itself, Mo, slow, -mo. slow Mo is yeah. really good. Uh, I could go friggin' miles. Um, have you read, have you read his book as well? Soul for, Soul for happy. No, I haven't. I've, 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 again, it's on my to read list, but I, here's my God. Yeah. I, I actually did a tweet recently of my top 10 podcast episodes that I recommend. So yeah, if people want to go and find me on Twitter, go delve into my a thread that I did yeah. recently around my top ten episodes that Amazing. I recommend. That was on there for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll leave to everything, Mo Gada. His <laughs> story is incredible, right? Oh, it's just in, insane. His whole mindset around it, and yeah, it's, it's, it's but the book definitely. Is, yeah, it's a long one. I think I I'm not a reader, so I'm all an audio. Have you got an audio? audio he reads it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I want to get it because he reads yeah. it. He's just like a ten hours beautiful human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly that. Mate, final one. What is your one rule for living a fulfilled life? Be relentlessly, relentlessly your authentic self. Love that. What mm. a brilliant way to finish, mate. Again, thank you so much for your support. Thanks for coming in. It's been brilliant. I'm definitely getting you back on for an episode too. We'll yeah. A little bit more into Love it. mindset stuff, but mate, thanks so much. And uh, that is a wrap, as they say. Brilliant. Good luck. <laughs> awesome. I believe every business owner has a story to tell. Through seeking true, authentic insights about the entrepreneurial journey, I provide a platform for our peers to share their stories and inspire those that listen. This is the County Business Talks podcast powered by Picture Book Films.